Welcome to the following Cordata video. Uh, I'll say from the outside that there is a bit of a delay uh, when changing slides where it cut off my voice, so you'll uh, just be patient with that uh, delay in the vocals and audio. Uh, here are your objectives. If you can do this, you'll have gotten what you need to out of this video and be fairly well prepared for the for the exam. Obviously, chordates, we know uh, we're very familiar with them because we are chordates. Most of them have a backbone. But we evolved from something that had a, we have a common ancestor with um, chordates that look like this. Here is a typical C squirt, very colorful one. Two openings. This is a solitary chordate, benthic. These are aggregated uh, benthic chordates, C squirts, blue bell tunicates. They're uh, very common for a short season around uh, the rocky shores of New Zealand. Here's another picture of these uh, beautiful, delicate creatures. And here's a picture of um, colonial sea squirts. These are called ascidians. And at first glance, you could be forgiven for thinking that they might be a sponge. But based on the shape of the little holes and the patterns, uh, as you'll see from the end, by the end of this video, uh, we can tell that they are ascidians, colonial ascidians, colonial tunicates, rather than uh, sponges, per reference. So, final chordata, um, the sequirts and salps don't have a backbone. They do not have a backbone. But, as we do, at some stage of their lives, they have four distinguishing characteristics of chordates. These are what you'll need to know. The four characteristics of chordates, which you have at one point in your development, your embryonic development, they have the notochord, which is a rod-like structure that uh, lends support to the body. Okay, so it's like a primitive backbone. In ours, with the, we've developed ossification around it, um, and that has meant that we have vertebra as well as many, many animals. Um, and in these invertebrates that we're talking about for this course, they don't have a uh, backbone. They have a notochord. They have a dorsal hollow nerve cord, as do we. Okay. This is your um, the nerve that runs down from the front of the body to the end and allows for coordinated movement from the brain at the front to um, the end. They have gill slits at some point in their body, They'll, or at some point in their development. All chordates have gill slits. And they also have the post-anal tail. So every other phylum that we've looked at uh, this year, every other phylum, has had the disposal unit, the anus, either um, at the, the same place as the uh, mouth. If it was a two-way gut or if it's a one-way gut, it's been at the very end of the body. If you see one where the anus is not at the end of the body, um, like you would be familiar with from a fish, then you are looking at a chordate. So this may be, as with us, that uh, only 
believe the larval state exhibits the four characteristics of the chordate. But with um, marine creatures, many of them disperse using a larva that looks something like this. It looks like a little bit of a fish. It can swim, um, but obviously is uh, not quite have doesn't quite have all of the um, adaptations of a fish. But it will swim. It will have gill slits. Notochord, dorsal, dorsal, dorsal hollow nerve cord, and the post anal tail. Right. We'll be concerned with two classes the Ascidiacea, which are benthic animals, and the Thaliacea, which are planktonic animals. Okay, so there you have two types, the compound ascidians This is what a uh, compound ascidian looks like, the uh, colorful one on the left. And what happens is they share the um, tunic. And this is um, uh, how you recognize them. They'll tend to have a central hole surrounded by a bunch of little holes. And then usually there's a little bit of color patteration. Not always, but uh, that uh, color the coloration pattern looks something like a flower with petals. Okay, so um, or you can also have solitary ascidians, which are the uh, sea squirts that we know very well. And here is an example of a solitary ascidian, uh, which is not a very beautifully focused picture, but it is a sea tulip. And you can find those commonly at Leisure Island or intertidal environments around are not intertidal, just subtitle environments around New Zealand. So the structure of uh, ascidians, okay, they have um, all four of the um, characteristics of chordates in their um, larval stage, but as adults, they lose all of them except for the gill slits. And they have a a uh, tough rubbery tunic that is the protective sheath over the animal and they're all attached. So here is a typical sea squirt and a um, YouTube URL that you can go to to watch the feeding. So the buccal siphon, we've seen buccal meaning above, around the mouth or about the mouth and uh, that's where water comes in, and then atrial siphon, where the water goes out. The tunic is soft and gelatinous, or it can be tough and rubbery. Um, we've already covered the atrial and bugal siphons. And then they have a filtering mechanism, which um, is uh, altered from the gill slits as the larval stage to the adults, and it's called the pharyngeal basket. And here you can see the pharyngeal basket um, where the water comes in through the buccal siphon, particles are filtered out, uh, that's all driven by cilia, as we've seen in the lamellibranch gill of the um, bivalves. And that drives the water column or the water current. And the food is digested and then goes out, the waste goes out the buccal siphon along with um, the water that's leaving the animal. Here is a uh, more complete diagram on the left of the anatomy of a sea squirt. And on the right, you can see a beautiful example of the pharyngeal basket through a clear tunic.
Okay, that is the filtering mechanism uh, by which they can sort out all the food particles that they filter out of the water column. Okay, the colonial ones uh, generally share an atrial opening, and they're surrounded by the individual buccal siphons. They also share a common tunic, and the typical flower-like pattern that we see is due to the shared atrial opening. So generally you'll see something like this, and you, this is what tells you that it's not a sponge. Um, rather than having, uh, because they look much like sponges, because they they exist in a in a similar manner, where they're benthic, they sit in one spot and they filter their feed by sucking water in and uh, into the the body, and then um, expelling it and filtering the particles out. So form following function, they often look very much like sponges. But here is how you know that they're a, a colonial lycian. So you'll see the mu multiple buccal siphons where water is coming in. And you'll see the central atrial siphon where they all dump water into. Um, and this is where water expels, leaves the body. So that's um, one shared atrial siphon. Okay, so they broadcast spawn sperm and then brood the eggs within the body. Uh, they also can reproduce asexually by budding, producing interconnected colonies. So all of the compound ascidians, when you see the compound ascidian, the colonial ones, they are all clones of one another from whichever one originally uh, started the colony and then asexually butted off the rest. Salps are the thaliacea. These are the planktonic ones. They're transparent, live in the plankton. The uh, part that you can see is generally what the they filter fed out of the water column and are digesting. It's the gut contents. And the buccal and atrial siphons they still have, but they're at each end of the body. Here is a typical salp, and you can see the oral opening on the one end, which is the buccal siphon, and the atrial opening on the other end. Uh, and you can very clearly see the pharyngeal basket, which is the filtering mechanism, and the um, also the digestive tract. Um, these salps are can be super abundant when they're when they're in bloom, and sometimes you'll see that when you're diving or uh, out fishing or anything around here, and it, or even walking up the beach, sometimes uh, you'll find that there are just millions and millions of these things washed up or floating through the water column. And that's because they can reproduce faster than any other planktonic filter feeder by asexual budding. And they make these chains, which break apart eventually uh, through wave action, but chains have been seen up to even 50 meters long, uh, where the water has been very still, where there's a laminar flow and not much um, uh, not much turbulence to break the chains. And there's your typical cell.